I think a lot of people are needlessly intimidated about wood carving. Not that there isn't some skill involved. Some carvings take a tremendous amount of artistic ability. But simple relief carvings aren't as difficult as they look. You merely cut around your shapes, you add a little layering, which causes uh, appearance of depth, maybe a little bit of texture to the surface, and you're done. A simple pile of leaves like this one can look pretty impressive, but almost anyone can do it. And today I'm going to show you how. We'll discuss materials, tools, how to secure your work. I'll walk you through the carving process step by step. When we're finished, you'll have the confidence to try it yourself, and I hope you do, because believe me, once you stop worrying about what doesn't really matter, you're going to have a blast. Today we'll focus on power carving with a rotary tool, because it's safe and it's forgiving of mistakes. We'll begin with the equipment I use, and I'll link to everything that I talk about below this video so you can get more details if you need them. For a long time, all I had was a cheap rotary tool. It was a knockoff brand with only three speeds. It wasn't ideal, a variable speed controller would have been much better, but it was good enough for my first carvings, and if that's all you have, it's good enough for you too. For those who'd like to upgrade to something a little more comfortable, you might just add a flexible shaft attachment to your existing rotary tool. I believe the Dremel brand will fit other rotary tool brands as well. Its narrow pencil-like shape makes it easier to maneuver around as you carve, and it won't obstruct your view of your work like a bulky rotary tool motor might. Whether you use a rotary tool alone or with a flex shaft, I think another worthy upgrade is a keyless chuck. Not only because it eliminates the need for a wrench to swap bits, which you're going to be doing a lot, but it quickly adapts between different shaft sizes. It sure beats changing the jaws back and forth in the standard chuck. Again, I think the Dremel brand keyless chuck will fit other tools as well, both on your rotary tool motor if that's all you have, or on your flex shaft. Once you do a little power carving, you may be hooked. That's when you might look into a power carving motor like this one. It has a flexible shaft and a foot pedal that's variable speed. The Weecher one that I use is a mid-range tool. I have a few complaints about it, mostly that the shaft gets a little hot. I may upgrade to a little better quality shaft later, but the Weecher motor has been perfectly fine for me. I don't recommend though that you run out and spend a lot of money on tools. As I said, you can get started with just a simple rotary tool. I'll even be switching back and forth between these different tools in this video just to prove you don't need the best equipment to get the job done. See if you enjoy power carving first, then decide if you want to upgrade any of your gear. Now let's talk about what's most important, your carving burrs. Depending on what I'm doing, I may use carbide, high-speed steel, diamond, or even stone burrs. Carbide burrs are great for fast carving and shaping. This is very important because it's easy to become impatient with a slow cutting burr that's taking forever to remove wood, and so you'll find yourself trying to speed things up by applying too much pressure or by cranking the speed on the tool up too high, and this can overheat and dull a steel burr, which will make your work even more frustrating. So I like the saber tooth carbide burrs with the porcupine shapes because they can really hog away the material. They come in various sizes and in four primary grits. You'll learn which profiles you prefer over time, but I'd just start simple, maybe with a coarse sphere, a coarse long taper with a point, a fine 3 8 inch flame, and a fine 3 8 inch dovetail with the grit on the flat end. These are the ones I chose for this project, but they will serve you well for many other carvings. It can, though, be a little confusing when I say carbide because these shear style burrs are sometimes also labeled as carbide. Now I'm no metallurgist, I cannot tell you the difference in material makeup between the two, but I can tell you that the shear style burrs, whether they be just labeled high speed steel or tungsten carbide, do not last as long as the porcupine style carbide burrs. In fact, I may go through a couple shear style burrs like these in a single large carving, but a porcupine carbide bit will last me many carvings. If not the quality of the material makeup of the burrs, the difference may just be the style. These porcupine style burrs are like little sanders. They remove material quickly while staying nice and cool. The shear style bits shave the wood rather than scratching it away, which leaves a smoother surface, but they cut more slowly, they heat up more easily, and they dull much sooner than the porcupine style burrs. 
So why use the shear style burrs at all? Why not use just the porcupine style? Because the shear style burrs do leave a smoother surface and more importantly, they come with sharper points than you can get on the porcupine style burrs. So you really need both types for your carving. The porcupine burrs are used for the rough work and to produce specific textures. The shear style burrs are used for finer details. For the finest work, however, I also use little diamond burrs. These are relatively inexpensive and they come in sets which I can buy online. They're basically ultra fine sanders. I also occasionally use cheap grinding stone bits for burnishing wood to a smooth surface. You can usually get all you need of these in just the set that comes with your rotary tool. You'll see how I use all of these bits when we start carving here shortly. Power carving can be a dusty process. I recommend a good mask. You can use the cheap paper masks if you want, but I want something that seals well. That's why I like the stealth mask from Trend. It seals around my face, but it's still lightweight and comfortable to wear for long periods of time. I also like to wear a Turner style smock that's tied around the neck to keep the dust and chips from getting down in my shirt. Again, I'll link to all this stuff below the video. Now let's talk about wood. The nice thing about power carving is you can easily carve many species of wood that might give you trouble with traditional gouges. I've carved a lot of pine, but hardwood is nice because it won't get fuzzy from fine splinters as much and it'll take finer details. Very hard exotic wood will take the finest detail, but it might scorch easily, so you're going to have to be careful with your tool speeds. If this is your first time power carving, I recommend using whatever scraps you have laying around. I'll be using a walnut offcut that I salvaged from the firewood pile. Finally, you need a way to hold your work so both hands are free to steady your tool. If I'm outside my workshop, I use a portable vise like this one. Inside the shop, I have a vacuum-based system that sucks the workpiece tightly down and is faster to adjust than clamps would be. Of course, vacuum systems like that are expensive, and if you're just getting started, you'll appreciate a cheaper option. The cheapest option may just be to clamp your workpiece directly on your bench or table top. It'll work, but it'll be a pain to adjust because you're going to have to turn it and adjust it frequently as you carve. So another idea is to attach your workpiece to something heavy enough to stay put without sliding around too much on you. The portable vise like this one adds significant weight. A true budget option may be to just glue your workpiece to a thick slab of wood, or you may build a box around some bricks or some sand and attach it with double-sided tape. By adding weight, you can then move the whole thing around as you need to, but still keep it from sliding around too much as you're trying to carve. Speaking of carving, let's get to it. Leaves are an excellent subject for a beginning carver because the shapes are pretty basic and nobody will care if they aren't perfect. You can find some photos online, cut them out and trace them on the wood, or even go out in your yard and pick up a few leaves that you can trace. I just draw something that looks sort of leafy. We'll be carving a shallow pile of leaves starting with a top layer, so I begin with three or four that are spaced pretty far apart. The first step is to outline their shapes and begin removing some of the wood around them. A pointed burr of some sort is a good choice here. Use the tip to get into the tight spaces while you use the rounded side to abrade away the open areas. You don't want to just dig a trough around your leaf. You also want to slope it outward away from the lines. Don't worry about getting everything smooth and perfect at this stage. We are just roughing things out. If you have a selection of bits, experiment with different shapes to find what you're more comfortable with. You want something that will easily remove the wood quickly, but also be easy to maneuver. A ball tip can be a great balance between these two factors, but its size may keep it from getting into tight spaces. So you have to experiment with what works best for you and what you're carving. You're going to make plenty of dust as you carve. Since you're most likely wearing a dust mask, you can't just blow the excess dust from the carving. So I stop every minute or so and I use a paintbrush to clean the surface of the carving. An air compressor hose laying nearby would be a handy way to do it as well. Try to sort of level out the open areas between your initial leaves to produce a new, slightly lower surface on which to begin the next layer. I find it easier if the second layer of leaves are larger in size than the first upper layer so the upper leaves won't totally obscure the shape of the lower leaves beyond recognition. Draw them so they overlap each other a little bit. Again, 
you can print out leaf images and trace them if you aren't able to draw freehand. Because these new leaves overlap each other, you have to decide which new leaves are on top and which are being overlapped. Outline the top leaves first, then work on those that lay beneath them. This type of partial layering is the key to creating a carving with depth and realism. I add a few more leaves and I begin outlining them. Periodically, I pause and I use a pencil to redefine the edges so I can keep track of what's overlapping what. We're still just roughing things out at this point, trying to define the different layers. For example, note how the small maple leaf appears to set on top of the larger maple leaf, and both look like they're on top of the oak leaf, as if they were three separate layers of the carving. This effect is achieved by removing wood along the lines between the leaves and blending the slopes outward. This sense of depth is further enhanced as I use a finer tool to define the edges of each leaf more sharply. I outline each leaf individually, keeping track of where it exists in the pile. This is where the layers really start to become clear. This layering principle is simple, but it's very important and worth repeating. Here we have the appearance of four distinct levels, the small leaf on top, the oak leaf beneath it, the point of the maple leaf beneath that, and the background at the lowest level. All of these steps are created by defining an edge and blending away from it. The entire large maple leaf on the bottom of the stack, for example, is not that much lower than the leaf on top. Just the parts that are near the overlapping portions have been lowered and blended out. This becomes more noticeable when you have the intersection of multiple leaves, each one separately defined along its edge with a fine tool. I really enjoy this part of the carving. I like the order of it all, as if I am arranging neat little layers into a stack. I also love how this makes the carving really begin to look three-dimensional. Of course, for things to really begin to look realistic, we have to give some shape to the flat surfaces of the leaves. This is best done with a teardrop-shaped burr because we can take advantage of both the point and the rounded side. You can spend all day making your leaves look as realistically as possible, but most people have no idea how the surface of a leaf should work. It's more about giving it some shape than giving it the absolute correct shape. The easiest way to do this is to create a cup where the lowest point is the stem running through the center and the surface rises from there up towards the rim. This doesn't mean you want every leaf to be a perfect cup shape. Your carving should have some variety. This oak leaf, for example, is pretty thick, so I may take advantage of that extra material to slope the edge along one side downward, creating a wave that rides from the center up and falls at the edge. This maple leaf is more challenging because the center stem is partially covered by the leaves that lay upon it, making it difficult to evenly slope the surfaces inward. So I make this surface more uneven, making it rise and fall as if it's beginning to dry out and wrinkle in places. On this small leaf, I've decided to create a deep cup to add some extra depth than you may expect from just a three quarter inch thick board. Next comes my favorite step, undercutting. This thins out the edges of the leaves to make them more realistic and adds shadows to create the appearance of even more depth. I switch away from the carbide burrs for this because I need a sharper point. I'm cutting beneath the edge of each leaf, creating an overhang. I love how this seems to make them rise from the background. I'm a big fan of aggressive undercutting, which does get me in trouble sometimes because I may make something too thin and break it off, but that's what super glue's for. Be careful not to overheat the steel bit, especially if you dig deeply beneath the leaf. You may have to slow your tool speed down or just avoid getting carried away and tunneling too aggressively. If you're scorching your wood, you're dulling your bit, so back it off. Around the outer perimeter of the carving, I have the most material to remove. I try to taper out the background toward the edges of the workpiece so it doesn't look like I dug a hole and laid some leaves inside. At this point, everything is well shaped and we can begin working on some of the finer details. If you aren't a pro, you're going to find it difficult to create well-defined, smooth surfaces with all the little veins that you would see on an actual leaf. My advice is don't try. Embrace the flaws and call it texture. In fact, a carbide burr is the ideal tool for this. After redefining my center stem with a sharp tool, I use a coarse carbide burr to create lines that radiate outward from the inner stem as they might on an actual leaf. 
This requires a light touch, just scratching the surface rather than carving more of it away. Angle your lines out from the stem and toward the tip of the leaf. You may also vary the pressure you apply to create lines of different depths and thicknesses. Sometimes I may go too far with this and the leaves begin to look kind of hairy. So I come back with a diamond burr, which works as sort of an eraser. It smooths those areas out, erases some of the lines, and I can use it to make the surface more varied, especially around the edges, which I think is a little more natural appearance. As I said, you can spend all day making a more realistic surface, but textured surfaces are much easier and more forgiving for a beginning carver. I think it's better to work within your skill level than to put unreasonable expectations upon yourself, which will inevitably lead to frustration. You aren't making this carving to be examined by a team of dendrologists. You're making it for regular people who have never carved anything in their lives, and they'll think it's amazing if your leaves just look a little leaf-like. Generally, I think less is more. Too many details, especially deep stems and veins, can make the surface look too busy. But you may add a few main branches off the center stems if you think it'll add to the realism. Finally, let's deal with the background. I like the dovetail-shaped burr, like this one, because I can use the top to even the surface out while getting pretty close to my carving. Don't get too close, of course. You don't want to take a chunk out of a leaf. Use very light pressure and do your best to keep the end flat on the workpiece so you remove the gouges instead of creating more. This won't produce a perfectly smooth surface, but it's a great way to begin evening out the worst of it. Try to blend toward the edges of the workpiece, removing the high spots. You don't need a flat background. You just want to reduce the appearance of a hole that's surrounding your carving. Since you can't get too close to the edges of your carving itself, you may come back with a ball-shaped diamond burr to even those tight areas. Work in tiny circular motions with light pressure so you aren't digging a trough around your carving. Next, I follow up with a ball-shaped grinding stone bit. The grit doesn't matter, any stone will work. I'm using very light pressure to remove the scratches left behind by the carbide burr. I'm burnishing the surface. It helps to hold the workpiece against your chest turning it frequently so the light rakes across the surface in different directions because that will reveal scratches you may have missed. Be sure to cover the entire workpiece all the way to the edges and into the corners. This will give the entire surface a more uniform texture and draw attention away from the lower portions. Finally, come back with a pointed stone bit and the same tiny random movements to apply the same texture into the tight areas around the edges of the carving where you couldn't get with a larger bit. And that is your first power carving. I know it seemed complicated because the video was kind of long and fast paced and there did seem to be a lot of steps, but once you get going, you'll see it isn't as difficult as it seems. Mistakes are easy to repair and even the simplest carvings will draw a lot of praise from those who just don't know how easy it is. See you next time. Power carving is a blast. You should try it sometime. Grab some scrap wood and some carbide burrs from Sabretooth Power Carving Tools and just give it a go. You may be surprised what you're capable of, like this folk art eagle I made from 2x6s. Check out what Sabretooth has to offer at the link below this video. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.